Awesome. If you're just getting in right now, there's a QR code uh, that's up there. We blew it up. Uh, you can follow along with the presentation. Uh, it's online, so you can follow in your own web browser. So uh, it has all the information that I'm going to go over with you guys today and talk about, and then um, including some resource or library links that you might want to check out later on. So. Uh, including links to resources that help me learn. So, cool. I think we should get started here. Oh, cool. Uh, well, let me do that. Yeah, let's just get started. <laughs> this is my first panel at MagWest, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> I wasn't sure if I was going to have a, uh, an arena-sized audience, or I'll settle for a half-arena-sized audience today. No, I'm really thankful you guys are all here today. Um, I wanted to, uh, just a quick overview, I'm going to talk a little bit about what I know and who I am, so you have an understanding of, of how I know things, and then uh, I'm going to talk about some of the different things that are happening in the retro game scene when it comes to modding, because it's an exciting time to be a, a video game console modder. Uh, with an emphasis on playing on original hardware, uh, if you know what everything that you see or are going to see up on the screen is done using original hardware, not emulated, it's all original hardware. Um, so, without further ado, who am I? <laughs> I'm a musician and an educator. Uh, I teach music uh, in public schools. Uh, I'm a gaming enthusiast. Uh, I grew up in the '90s, so I'm old, as the kids say. Um, I am a Sega Genesis kid. I was Team Sega all the way. Uh, I never owned an SNES as a kid. That was the one console that got away. So, <laughs> um, who am I not? Uh, I'm not a medical doctor, so if you have a medical emergency, please seek professional help. I'm not a Gene Simmons cosplayer, although I make a good Gene Simmons. Uh, <laughs> most notably, I am not an electrical engineer uh, or a software developer. I'm neither of those things. Uh, I have a passing interest, uh, actually, really more like an active interest in understanding those things, but I'm not, I was not actually trained in those things. Uh, and I'm not a professional repair technician. These are skills that I learned. What I did or how I got into this, um, I guess, hobby, if you will, the reason I became an enthusiast is I, I started with wanting to be able to solder. I just wanted to be able to solder and do simple repair work. Uh, and then it turned into, well, I wonder if I could do this. And then I wonder if I could do this. And before I knew it, I was modding game cubes. So uh, that's what happened. Um, and I'm not a salesman or a spokesperson for any of this stuff. So the stuff, it's all, I'm not sponsored by anybody. I'm not trying to sell you anything. I'm just trying to show you what's out there, what's possible uh, using existing hardware that you may have sitting in your attic or garage somewhere. So, um, so why is retro, retro modding awesome in 2023? It's got a huge open source community that's supporting it. I can't stress this enough. Everything that I'd learned and I did has been through open source sor uh, resources, uh, either video tutorials or how-to videos. Um, even the actual mods are developed by people who are passionate about doing this and supporting these consoles. It's a very much, no corporate interests are engaged in this. It's all developer homebrew people who are passionate about supporting uh, these classic consoles. Um, there's an increase of highly skilled uh, en electrical engineers with a passion for retro gaming. Um, there are advancements in and the availability of what are called platform ASICs. These are application-specific integrated circuits. That's just big fancy term for nice chips. They do a lot of cool stuff um, and we're able to, uh, the dev community is able to leverage those to produce, uh, to meet certain design challenges. There's also this huge development in what's called FPGA. How many of you guys have heard the term FPGA before? Yeah, I see quite a few hands go up. The biggest FPGA project that's open source right now is the Mr. Project. Uh, that is sort of the next level of hardware and uh, game preservation for the arcade community. So if you're familiar with MAME or Final Burn, those are huge um, emulation systems or emulation environments. What, uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about FPGA, but we're no longer emulating at the software level. We're now emulating at the hardware hardware level, which means that FPGAs are providing us the opportunity to recreate consoles at a base level or at a fundamental level, which means that these consoles now, the new FPGA consoles, behave just like their original consoles that you can get. Um, and then there's also the, a big development in this has been the lowering of prototyping costs. So now developers or homebrew developers can d take their designs, go to some place like PCB Way, and have their stuff printed for them and then shipped over in a short run quantity of like 100 units. And then that cost isn't what it used to be even 10 years ago, which is exciting. 
Um, another reason why uh, retro modding is getting cool now, there's a maturity in the 3D printing space, including uh, design exchange hubs. What that means is like things like mounting, uh, custom mounting pieces, things uh, that, uh, that you would have to have gone into a large production run. If you are familiar with the manufacturing process, most everything that's done is, uh, that's undone at scale is done with a process called injection mold. Uh, it's a very costly process. It requires that you create a mold and then they inject the uh, melted plastic into it and then they do those in large quantities. But it doesn't make sense to set that up uh, for you know a thousand pieces. Then you were talking like hundreds of thousands of pieces. But now we've gotten to the point where 3D uh, printing allows us to do it not only at these short runs, but also at our, in the comfort of our own home. If you have a 3D printer, either a filament or a resin printer, you can do these designs now and they're freely shared among the population or among the community. Crowdfunding that supports passionate devs, I can't stress this enough. The, the way that I started learning about people is through Patreon and through um, Kickstarter, just seeing these projects pop up. And it just takes you know a passionate dev saying like, I really wanna do this. I wanna support the Sega Genesis. I wanna support the PS1. And then they come up with this crowdfunding project to fund it. They reach their stretch goals and before you know it's fully funded and then some. Because the community who wants these things is super passionate about supporting these devs who are eager to, pr to bring these products to the community. Um, com and then the, this is the biggest one, I think, uh, community vetted information tutorials and guides. So in the early days of mod modding is nothing new. We've been modding consoles since the NES, right? It's nothing new. What is new and what is at, uh, uniquely advantageous to now is that the information that we learn about is actually vetted by people who understand and know what they're doing. <laughs> it isn't like, you know, urban legend that's passed down where you can find Mew under the truck near the the dock, right? It's not, information like that now gets vetted and communities on Reddit and YouTube will come out and say like, uh-uh, that's not good information. And so what has emerged in the last 10-ish years, but especially in the last five, you've seen a, uh, a growth in, what we, in thought leaders, people who are actually telling people, no, this is not good information, this is how it should be. Uh, and because you have those skilled people now becoming the voices in the community, you're getting actually really reliably good working mods for your consoles that really leverage these consoles to be playable for the remainder of uh, another 50, 60 years even. And then my favorite is nostalgia. It's a hell of a drug. <laughs> uh, I can tell you. <laughs> I grew up in the 90s, so playing a Sega Genesis or, or pulling out a GameCube or a PS1 or any of these consoles, it is a trip down memory lane for me. Uh, it's an opportunity for me to, to relive my childhood, to extend my adolescence. Uh, and so, sorry. Uh, <laughs> so for me, playing these on these original consoles, it's just, it feels great. Yes, there are other ways to play these games on Nintendo Switch Online or PlayStation Plus, Minus, whatever they call it now, and Xbox Premium, Extra Platinum, Gold, whatever. There are all these ways you can do this, but but if you have an attachment or love for these original consoles, there's still a way to do it now. Um, so techno babble time. Uh, I told you guys a little bit about, and I'm priming you all you guys to understand some of this tech, not because I'm trying to off, uh, you know, front load you guys with all this stuff, because I want to give you guys a context to understand. If, if it goes over your head or this doesn't matter, I apologize, but I just wanted to put this information out there. So again, important tech, there's been some important technological developments, wider access to off-the-shelf ASICs. Again, those are those application-specific ICs. It's allowing these uh, developers, these homebrew people, to really start to prototype and realize their visions. Improvements in low-power computing. I can't stress this enough. Low-power computing is where it's at. Because if you can do more with less power, then you can lower the footprint, you can lower the form factor, and that allows you to squeeze these, these modules or these components into existing footprints, like inside the Genesis. Or you can um, you can back, you can uh, piggyback on top of like their 5 volt or 3 point volt or 3 volt logic that is inside of these consoles. And so that's what uh, these developers are doing. You don't have to add an additional power source to these consoles to get these new mods to work. They use the existing system, and that's because of advancements in low-power computing. Um, access to FPGA uh, dev boards, so the DE10 Nano, which is popular in the Mr. community. Uh, there's also the Pluto uh, ma, uh, the Pluto dev board, which is used for, um, uh, again, engineering, uh, designing, and prototyping, but has been leveraged now to create an HDMI output uh, system for the GameCube in particular. Uh, and then budget prototyping, so through places like PCB Way. 
Um, FPGA chipsets, a lot of you are familiar. I'll just quickly go over for those who are unfamiliar. Uh, they have aided in some important uh, breakthroughs. So uh, one of the ways that FPGAs have been successful is to help uh, support the development of what we call ROM carts. These are carts that you can put inside of existing cartridges, uh, cartridge systems like the Sega Genesis. I have one here I'm going to show you guys by uh, developed by a guy named Crix, uh, who's developed what's called the EverDrive. Um, he uses FPGA boards to replicate uh, basically the chipsets, the uh, mask ROM sets that are that used to be inside of Genesis consoles or inside of um, NES cartridges, and then basically tell trick the console into saying I'm a legitimate uh, cartridge. And then he's turned around and then used uh, solid state media like SD cards to then load your ROMs through that interface. It's really cool. Uh, optical drive emulation. This is really big. ODEs are big for disk-based systems. So like uh, the Saturn, the PlayStation, uh, the Xbox, well, or the Xbox had a hard drive in it already at the start. But what is happening is, is that these these um, laser assemblies are aging. They're at least at the oldest, at the youngest, they're about 25 years old. Uh, at the oldest, they're about 30 years old now. If you have a Sega Saturn or a Sega CD like I have, and so these consoles, these assemblies are not meant to last forever. They have a lifespan, and lasers tend to go out really, really fast, uh, and relative to everything else. Uh, and the early technology is especially like Sega CD or um, TurboGrafx CD, if you're familiar, or PC Engine CD. Some of those early um, tech with lasers are really starting to die. And so the only, and they're not being manufactured anymore, so the alternative is to emulate the drive using these FPGA chipsets. So they can emulate a disk laser assembly to read the, uh, read the stuff and trick the console into thinking that the disk is there. Ultra low latency scalers. This is really important because what you're doing now is you're taking these analog signals. A lot of these old consoles, we're all familiar with 1080p, right? Full HD, and now everybody's got 4K televisions, right? Well, consoles like the NES or the Sega Genesis, they put out 240p, or a 240 progressive, sp uh, progressive display. And that's a really, uh, s you know, really small picture, right? And if you just straight put that onto a 1080p, it's going to look like a little box inside the very center. Um, so these scalers are really important because what they're doing is they're taking it and then they're doubling that information or quadrupling that information onto your, onto your fat, flat panels. And on top of that, it's doing it at near uh, lagless, uh, no, there's almost no lag between it. So you're getting lossless digital to an oh, analog to digital conversion, which is huge because if you've ever taken your NES or SNES and just plugged it into uh, the back of your television without one of these scalers, you're going to hit a button and then Mario is going to jump like a second later, which is the de it's like that's not good in a platform <laughs> if you're, you know, if you're trying to platform across. Um, and then there's also uh, FPGAs are being used to support the development of new peripherals. Uh, I have two peripherals I wanted to, uh, I'll demo to you guys too. Um, one of them are is a memory card that creates virtual memory cards for something like the PlayStation and then the 8-bit mods did that one. And they also did one just recently for the GameCube. What that means is you've got infinite storage now and it's being saved onto solid state media that will not lose its memory, right? You won't, there's no battery to worry about. There's no uh, power, That's there's no uh, flash ROM that's being saved in there. It's just going onto an SD card. And then you can take that and drop it into an emulator and continue your game play. So you can take your saves, even from your classic saves. I have some saves from when I had my GameCube back in 2003, uh, 2002, 2003, that I was able to take and put onto my game card and play through Dolphin and continue where I left off 20 years later. is wild. Uh, <laughs> so it's really awesome uh, what we've been able to achieve in just the last uh, few years. I want to give you just a brief, again, a little more uh, information before I get into demoing these things. Um, AV scalers, uh, I talked a little bit about that. No zero lag, and it's especially uh, helpful with LCD flat panel technology. First generation LCDs, like stuff from like 2003, 2004, terrible. Terrible, terrible, terrible. Uh, we all got them because we thought it was the future, how wrong we were. Uh, it's taken about 10, 15 years uh, for that technology to really mature to the point where it's starting to reach uh, parity with what is called cathode ray tubes or CRT televisions, the 
giant things that are sitting in your grandma's corner uh, in, inside her living room. And I have one, and I love mine. I'll keep it until the day I die or my wife says, leave it or we get divorced. One of the two. Uh, but I, I absolutely love my CRT. It is, if you, it, you know, it's the way to play these consoles as they were intended to be, uh, has, as game developers designed them to be played on these televisions. And they leverage some of the characteristics of CRTs to make the games feel and respond a certain way. Well, CRTs are fundamentally different than um, uh, flat panel technology. So instead of uh, what we call, a, it's an electron gun that's shooting the signal, right? And it's sending the signal down a tube and then projecting it onto a television, you have individual little dials, these little lights that are behind the panel, and each one of them are being sent an electrical signal to turn on or off or to change color. Well, that takes time. And if that isn't done fast enough, the first generation stuff was not fast enough, right? And then it's getting faster now. We're getting 120 hertz refresh rates. We're getting 144 hertz re uh, refresh rates. In order for a flat panel to match the refresh potential of a CRT, we have to be at 1,000 megahertz, 1,000 hertz refresh rates on an OLED panel to reach that parity. That's the difference. We're getting there, uh, but the thing that's happening, there are two sort of salient directions that are going in this business. The first one is uh, that the, the panels are getting bigger, more resolution. So you're getting 4K monitors, then you got 1440, et cetera. These add time, lag. So when you start upscaling to 4K and on, you're introducing lag into your gameplay because now there's more pixels that the processor in your TV has to turn on and off. So um, there's that, and then there's also the size of the television that starts to affect it, although that's no longer much the case anymore. And then the type of technology, OLED versus LCD versus plasma. Plasma is no longer a thing anymore. Um, but these technologies all played a role in that. Uh, scalers are especially important to, uh, and really quickly, to Gen 5 and Gen 6 consoles. That was around the time that consoles stopped being like specialized devices and they started to look more like computers, like just low-powered computers for their day. And one of the things uh, in certain games, it's a well-known thing where there are resolution switches. And uh, to a CRT, remember, we need a flat panels that are a 1,000 hertz refresh rate to match the potential of a CRT. Well, sometimes you have like a, a frame drop or something like that, especially, I forget which game it is. I think it's Resident Evil Code Veronica where you go into the start menu. The, the you get If you're on a regular flat panel, when you hit that start button, there's a drop because the signal has to drop because it switches resolutions. It goes to, I think, uh, four something, 428 or 468p, and then it goes back to 240p for your regular gameplay. To a CRT, it makes no difference. It'll take that signal and, and do it really fast, but to a flat panel, that signal drops and then it has to reinitialize, which can interrupt your gameplay. Uh, so scalers have been a great intermediary to be able to take that signal and not drop it on, on modern televisions. So um, the ones that I'm going to show you guys today, I have actually, I, did, I have my GBS control, but I'm, I figured with everything in the panel length, I figured I'd just work, stick to my retro tink. Uh, but GBS control is an open source one that you guys can get. Uh, a lot of people have co-opted that design. It was actually an originally a VGA board that was used for um, uh, arcade machines to go from CRTs to LCDs. And they wanted to develop a low cost board that could do that. And then somebody found a way to sort of co-opt it and then install custom firmware and then now we have this op to, uh, total open source operating system. And you can build one your own. Uh, I think total parts, if you know how to do it, is about 50 bucks. And you can make one yourself. Uh, if you buy a pre-made one, it's about 80 to 120, depending on the features that they add. Uh, and then the one that I'm using today and what you're going to see all their gameplay go through is the, it's called the Retro Tink. And this is developed by a gentleman by the name of Mike Chi. He lives in San Diego, California. He's a passionate developer who's really, it, it, it's, he's found a space in the gaming community because gamers really want this tech. But it also applies to past media, so any analog media, video VHS or Betamax uh, tapes, if you want to find a way to reliably digitize them or play those formats on modern televisions, his technology has applications there as well. Uh, but the gaming community has totally embraced that. So that's the one that I have. Uh, and these all have have varied inputs. The ones that I'm using today, you will see everything is at the highest level of analog signal. So the one that everybody's familiar with is composite. That's that yellow cable that you plug into your TV and you get a little fuzzy image. Uh, but today I'm using component cable, which actually splits that signal uh, into RGB. And then there's another one called luminance that tells how bright something is. And then there's a sync signal as well. And then I'm also using another, uh, not proprietary format, but another specialized format known as SCART, uh, which is popular, was popular 
popular in Europe and is, uh, for much of the, the analog era. Uh, and then that actually offered uncompressed true RGB. So if you lived in Europe and you played these consoles in Europe, you got the best best op, uh, best video out of these consoles because those consoles, uh, those TVs and those uh, hookups handled those things. In the United States, we tried to do everything as cheap as we could. Uh, um, any questions so far on this stuff? We all good? Because I want to talk about some consoles. So um, the consoles I brought today, uh, I didn't. I opted not to do my Nintendo Super NES Junior, but um, that one is, is a, that was a fun little mod. But I do have the Sega Genesis. These are consoles I've modded. I've done the an NES Junior, SNES Junior, the Genesis. This is the Saturn, the N64. I've done an HDMI mod on that. Uh, I've done the PlayStation 1, which I have here today. I've done the GameCube. That's my most feature-rich console that I have here today that I'll talk about. Uh, I've done the Dreamcast, which is my personal favorite console uh, that has quite a few mods in there. I've also modded recently an original Xbox. Uh, there's some really cool uh, tech that just came out for that. And I've done an assortment of Game Boy Colors, Game Boy Advances, and um, Game Boy Pockets. So uh, those are, hey, Anthony. Yeah, <laughs> Uh, oh, you bring you bring me gifts. Cool. Um, <laughs> they're Robbie droppings. They're Robbie droppings. Gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> Anthony and I are playing with Super Soul Bros later today. If you uh, if you're gonna come check out the music, yes. Uh, Come to the show. <laughs> yes, please come to the show. Tickets are free with your badges. So, <laughs> um, so uh, the SNES Junior, I, I have some pictures of it up here. Um, the consoles were released originally in 97. Uh, it's a refresh of the original console that came out in 1991. And I modded it to put out lossless digital and audio through a digital analog converter. It was developed by a gentleman by the name of Voltar. Uh, he's on YouTube, and, and uh, he has a really cool shop that you can buy mods from as well. Uh, and then I also combined it with an EverDrive, and then some 8-Bit Doe is a really popular uh, OE, uh, like creator of um, classic controllers in original configurations, but you can they have them communicating now over 2.4 gigahertz uh, or Bluetooth, uh, which I have some, uh, I don't have those here to show you, but I'm going to demonstrate some of that tech to you guys. But I, I didn't bring that one today, but I do have a photo. If you can see it on the bottom right, that's a photo straight up from my television. The pixels come in super clear, super clean, and through my retro tank, um, they're, they're completely lossless. You can make out every single detail, uh, which I really, really love. Uh, the one that I, first one I want to show you guys and actually have here for you today is my Model 2 Genesis. Um, so the Genesis is notoriously, like it has failings depending on which gen of the console you have. So if you got the first generation console, which is the one that, that looks like it has a CD base and all that and says high definition graphics on it and stuff, that was the first one that came out and that one is really good for audio. It had the best audio sound, but not the best picture quality. And then they came out the Model 2, they fixed the picture situation, but then the audio got bad. It's like, what? What happened there? Uh, and so the challenge there was, um, well, how can we make these consoles good all around? So they came up, someone mod, uh, came up with this mod, it's called the Triple Bypass Mod. And what you do is you lift all those signals off the board at certain parts, which, uh, and you tie them in on the right there, the picture on the right is that little board, you tie all those signals in. And they call it the triple bypass because if you're familiar with this console, it's also known as the Tower of Power. How many of you guys have heard of that before? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Not the band, but uh, also a fan. <laughs> but they called it the Tower of Power because not only uh, the original Model 1 had the CD system on the bottom, then you put the cartridge console on the, in the middle, and then you can add this other contraption called the 32X, which is another little piece that they added, and then you stack them, on, uh, stack them all up and it's called the Tower of Power. Well, this mod lifts all of those signals off of the main board, because every one of those peripherals goes through the central console. And so you lift all those signals off, and with this board, I'm able to get lossless, really good, clean audio sound. Would anyone like to play the Sega Genesis I have here right now? It's Trevor, come on up, man. <laughs> Let's give a round of applause for Trevor. So come on over here, and then I already have a game going. That's the wrong system. Cool. And let's go. OK. So and then here's your controller. And you can see it right here. And then you can look on that while I talk to the audience. Here's, you can watch that here. And then the audio hit start. Yes. OK. And then can we all hear the audio? 
So the console that you're, he's playing on original hardware. This is a cartridge-based uh, game. This is uh, Revenge of Shinobi, right? There we go. Uh, and if you notice, this is going straight into an HDMI workflow. So if you hit start, hit start to begin, hit start again. There you go. Have fun. So every, if you notice, look how clear and clean all the pixels are. And to, by Trevor's perspective, he's actually going into another monitor that's doubling out to there. It looks even more impressive when you see it through an OLED because the blacks are super rich and, only, and it does local dimming. And that's a big deal because that's a lot of the, it replicates as close as possible what the CRTs used to do. But there's almost, there's zero lag. Uh, they've done, uh, I see your hand, give me a second. They've done tests where uh, they have this thing called the time sleuth and they put it over and they measure how much lag these devices are doing because anytime you introduce something into a signal chain that is from the source to wherever you're viewing, there's the potential for lag. It's just a natural thing that happens. This device through the retro train, through that scaler, zero lag. Zero lag. Because if this were going straight into your regular you know, consumer television, it'd be lag city. They have no interest or economic desire to invest in super fast analog to digital conversion systems. So that's where Mike Chi steps in, and that's why these devices matter. I saw a hand go up. Yeah. So this is outputting to 1080p right now. Uh, and then the console, so what it does is the console is interpreting the signal that's going to into it. Oh, I'm sorry, the retro thing is interpreting the Sega Genesis at 240p, and then it's up it to 1080p. So that's how you get the super clear pixels in there. And then again, if you saw it on, and if you, at the end of the present, at the end of the panel, you're welcome to come and check it out on the, on the panel up front. It's really impressive. Again, original hardware. This console could do this. It's just that it was hindered by the, the, the technology of its time. And also the fact that most consumer televisions in the North America could not put out a picture this clear. So they didn't, they didn't bother investing in time and energy to do that. What do you think, Trevor? Nice. Do you like it? Yeah, it looks great. OK, so watch this. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so <laughs> don't press it. <laughs> Mom, I'm not done yet. Okay, so. <laughs> <laughs> So over here, uh, what I did is I hit the reset button. Uh, and you can see right there, this is what that ROM cart is doing. This is the EverDrive. They call it the Mega EverDrive because the original console was called the Mega Drive in uh, Japan and in Europe. But we called it the Sega Genesis here. Um, what you're seeing is there's an SD card inside of this cartridge that is loading the ROMs onto there. I can't tell you where to get those, but your favorite search engine can. So just know that if you just searched up ROM, <laughs> ROM, ROM set, <clears throat> uh, redump, <clears throat> and then you find those things, you'll get them. But just know that they're out there. Um, but Trevor, I want you to hit B on the, on the controller there. Good. And then so the way I've organized it in this way, just because there's so many games, but you can go up and down. Just find the game that you want to play, Trevor. Let's go to, let's play a Sonic game, because we're on Genesis. So hit A. There you go, and then you can go down to Sonic, right? No, key, yeah, keep going down. Go, you gotta go left, go left and right. There you go, keep going. You're on page 18 now. Keep going left. Okay. Left, left, or what is it, what, what do you wanna hit, do we have some? Tecmo Super Bowl. Okay, let's pull that one in. Tecmo T. Keep going one more to the right. There you go. And then let's do the uh, the MD one. Yeah. Up, up, right there. No, right there. Hit A. No, 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 no. Not the beta. Yeah, there we go. Not the beta. Here, A. Okay, so this, uh, did you hit A? And then hit select and start. Good. So now what this, done, what this has done is it's loaded that game into the FPGA. It's replicating what a uh, Sega cartridge would do, and it's now loaded it into the console. To the console, it's like you've loaded that game into there. But now you can play it, and I have no memory. I did not play Tecmo Super Bowl. I'm sorry. <laughs> but for those that did, does this look good? Hit start, Trevor. <laughs> <laughs> Hit start again. Let's see you get destroyed in the tank. Go, preseason. Go. go, just hit start again. There you go. Man versus calm. <laughs> uh, what do you want to play? Uh, <laughs> Dallas? Where are you from? I'm trying to find the 
Wait, where? What? <laughs> let's go with the dub bears. Yeah, let's go. Hit start. Hit start. Right. Or A, A, A. There you go. Okay, now you're an opponent. Just hit A again. Good. Okay. Here we go. We're in the preseason. The anticipation is killing me. The Bears versus the Bills. So everything, again, just to stress, this is all going out through the console. It's being interpreted by the scaler. The scaler is getting the best possible signal it can, thanks to that triple bypass that I installed into the Sega Genesis. And now this game can be played on your modern television, and it'll be like you're 11 all over again. Go get it. Oh! Let's give a round of applause, Trevor, everybody. <laughs> Thank you, Trevor. You are done. <laughs> I'm moving on because I want to get to some other consoles. So that was the Sega Genesis. Um, do we have any Sega uh, PlayStation fans here? Yeah. Original PlayStation. Who would like to play test on some? Who would like to be my? You want to be my guinea pig? Come on up. What was your name? Chase. Chase? Yeah. Come on up, Chase. So I'll have you come over and uh, come around this way. And only because I love this sound. Yeah. I'm gonna yeah. <laughs> let's get it. Let's get it. Let's see get if it if it loads up. Is it gonna do it? Oh, there we go. Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh, you wanna do that again? Okay, hold on, hold on, hold on. Okay, hold on. Okay, hold on. okay. okay. All right. I'm sorry. Okay, okay. Here we go. Ready? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Give it a second. That's as loud as I can get it. I'm That's the stuff right there. <laughs> That's the stuff. Cool. So now, Chase, what's going to happen is this console has been modded with what's called that ODE, Optical Drive Emulator, using, again, that FPGA tech that is helping us to create these uh, custom chipsets. What happens now is there's a, uh, a little board that's designed inside the console, and it loads up the game. I'm going to tone that down a little bit. It loads up the game through an SD card. Again, I can't tell you where to get these ROMs, but I'm sure your favorite search engine can. Um, so it, there's an X station is the, the name of the mod. It, uh, it requires some soldering. This is why I'd lo this is actually one of the, this is like the third mod I ever did, because uh, I was excited, and PlayStation 1s are really cheap. So if I broke one, I'd be like, oh, well. <laughs> But uh, success on the first try. Uh, and then the X station is a software environment. It's open source code that someone developed to be able to run on that board. So Chase, you, uh, I have some games there you can pick. Is there one that meets your fancy? This is Castlevania? Symphony? Yeah, I think it should be. Would it go down? Double check, because, yeah, it's Symphony. So go to Castle. Just the one that says Castlevania is the Symphony one. So hit X, and then do fast load. So this now, there's an again, there's a board in there. It's pretending to be the drive, the, the CD drive. PlayStation 1, first generation consoles are notorious for, it takes a little bit to load up, it's notorious for uh, CD, uh, the console, the lasers burning out and dying. And so, um, they're prime candidates for this type of technology because you can put new life into these consoles. It doesn't have to go into a landfill anymore. Um, so the X station, it's a, you can buy it at retail. If you want to install it yourself, it's a hundred bucks. Uh, if you pay an installer to do it, you can tack on anywhere from like fifty to eighty bucks. Um, then you can create. So there's a, uh, a save in there. You can just pull out that save if you like, or you can create a new game. Um, but it's telling the console, hey, this disc is in there. Play this game. The other piece of tech that's in there, and I don't have it, uh, you, you can come and check it out later. Chase, you can look over and you can see it right now. But there's a little memory card. It's got a little L OLED screen in there. It's creating, it's communicating. The developer of 8-Bit Mods developed, uh, worked with X Station developers for these two peripherals to communicate with each other. So when you play this game, it creates a virtual uh, card of the game. And to the console, it looks like you only have one card with nothing else in it. And so, but the, the memory card knows which game you've loaded up, loads up that virtual memory card, and then you have, inf uh, technically speaking, effectively infinite saves, right? Infinite save space on there. And it changes based on the game that you're playing. So uh, this is also going out through uh, component video. Uh, this is sort of the one of the consoles where and it doesn't make sense. They have mods for HDMI to be able to do HDMI mods on the PlayStation. But doing just regular component output video, the PlayStation 1 has some amazing, amazing um, 
uh, output, video output. I'm actually using what's called a SCART connector. That's that connector that was popular in Europe. Uh, the SCART connector does RGB, pure RGB, and it's being interpreted by the retro team scaler and then outputting that to 1080p. Uh, you're getting 60 frames. A, a full 60 frames, full uh, audio signal, uh, digital signal also coming out of the console. This console was released in 1996? 1996. Well, here we are in 2023, and it looks just as good as if you were playing it on Nintendo Switch Online or PlayStation whatever, right? Um, this is where I couldn't get past. I tried to fight. Did you, can you help me? Do you know how to do this? Ah, oh, nice. This is what I loved about original consoles. You can call in your big brother to be like, dude, can you help me? I'm so stuck. Can you tell me? Well, my friend told me at lunch that... <laughs> oh, oh. You're trapped now. <laughs> can you do it, Chase? Oh. Now, Chase, as you're playing it, what does it feel? Does it feel responsive? Yeah, it's super great. It's so better than the Xbox 360. Wait, say that again one more time. Better than the Xbox 360 play, for sure. It's better than the Xbox 360, that's for sure. And it's true, because you're, those emu... <laughs> and there we have it. You can't win them all. You can't win them all. Let's give a round of applause to Chase, everybody. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Did you have fun with that one? Dude, thank you for your help. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you, Chase. The, um, the truth is, is that if you don't know, whenever you play Nintendo Switch Online or Rare Replay or any of these, those were not, they're just taking the software and putting it through an interpreter that is then turning it into, it's basically running on an emulator. That game that Chase was just playing is interpreting, it's working on the system as it was intended to be worked on. So the, it, it takes into account what the developers were doing, so they knew what the environment they were coding for, and then the console is interpreting exactly as it's supposed to. So you're getting flawless gameplay out of it because that's what it was designed to do. When you start to add filters your, or, or lenses to the interpretation of a game through emulation, you start to get uh, indiscrepancies and, and issues that arise. So that was the uh, PlayStation X or the X Station mod for uh, the PlayStation. I wanted to move on now to uh, what would you guys like to do? GameCube or Dreamcast? Oh, yeah, it seems a bitter divide. Let's see. <laughs> all those in favor of GameCube, raise your hand. Ooh, okay, all right, hands down. All those in Dreamcast, raise your hand. <laughs> All right, hands down. I will oblige. It looks like the GameCube has it. So I'm gonna give. I'm gonna take a second to set this up. Actually, Anthony, can I get your assistance here? Um, so I just need you to get an HDMI and maybe unplug it from. <laughs> here you go. This one. Yes. No, no, no. That one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's gonna. Mm. No, not that one. <laughs> no, not that one. That one will explode. Oh, okay, okay. Use. Hold on, I need to get you next. I need to get to you one. Oh no, no. <laughs> I thought I set everything up. It's just like one wire. I know it's just like one wire. Okay, let me just do this. Let me do. Well, because the GameCube doesn't need to be uh, retro tape, so you can plug it straight into here. HDMI. HDMI. Okay. Awesome. Okay, then I want you to use this one first. Ooh. Okay. Go ahead and plug that in. I'll do it for you. There you go. Okay, before you turn this on. Awesome. Okay, before you turn this on, let me make sure it's up there. Yeah. Okay. So why don't you come in and have a seat over there? And let me make sure that this workflow is right. No. What? <laughs> Yes, we can talk about that. Okay, so this is the GameCube. This is running on, um, this is a mod that I did. Uh, there are very many, there are different, okay, first off, let me talk about the GameCube as a console itself. So as a console, uh, it was one of the first consoles, it's kind of ahead of it, it, a lot of it was ahead of its time, much like the Dreamcast. They started programming this console to be able to output a progressive scan display. 
display. So progressive versus interlace, it's an old format. Interlace is we have like slices of the image and then they flicker between the two images and then our brains interpret that as a complete picture. That's, uh, they played on an optical illusion for on our brains and it lowered the bandwidth because when you only have to send half the picture, you can transmit it at half the, half the density. Um, but then you get this flickering effect. Uh, and CRTs, because it refreshes so fast, you barely notice it, but you do notice it on uh, flat panel technologies because it's having to turn those lights on and off. So uh, this console is one of the first to actually have come with it standard a progressive, plan, a progressive display output, a digital output. And so the first version of the Dolphin is what the code name was for this, for the GameCube. Um, the first version has two ports in the back. One is the standard analog output that was on the SNES and then was on the N64 and then eventually the GameCube. And then they had this other port, which was, they had a Nintendo sold it for a very, 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 very short time. They're really expensive. They're about like 400 bucks, I think, last I checked, for these original, these OEM, uh, sorry, I'm going to lower this a little bit. <laughs> they have these, uh, uh, they, the, it outputs, uh, they had the, these component cables that you can put through um, that got you uh, really nice progressive 420, 480p, 480 progressive scan display, which means that the screen is being drawn, each frame is being drawn from beginning to end. That gives you smoother gameplay or smoother images. And this is before HD televisions were popular. There was a, uh, an in-between format known as EDTV, Enhanced Definition TV, be, that was just before HD televisions and if you've ever remembered them they were like small little flat panels with speakers on the side and mom or dad would have them in the kitchen it's like look we can watch morning news in the kitchen uh, and then you can do them with HD uh, sort of this 480p um, display and it looks really nice um, but it's still an analog format not full uh, 1080 HP uh, HD excuse me uh, what has happened now is we've they've taken that FPGA development created used the Pluto board I installed it myself there's outboard mods that you can plug in. There's one developed by uh, Retrobit that you can plug in that does the same thing. I wanted a cleaner look because I wanted to just be able to plug an HDMI cable in. So after the panel, if you want to come and see what that looks like, but you can plug an HDMI straight into this GameCube and it'll output through that uh, 480p signal. On top of that, the FPGA, the instead of a RetroTINK, an outboard analog processor like the RetroTINK is here, the doubling is happening inside on the FPGA. So it's outputting 1080p. So it's interpreting the 480p signal and then up-resing up or line doubling it so that you get a really nice, uh, I'm sorry, 720p, not, not 1080p, but you get really nice in, uh, signal. Um, so this is a disc that I have inside of here. Anthony, I'm going to turn this off really fast. So this game is inside here. This is a disc-based media. So here's the disc, right? Anthony, I'm going to tell you a little secret. I want you to hold the start button, OK? Now you've activated a secret menu. Secret! <laughs> So this is now one of the biggest, most important mods that has come out. Uh, we can now hard mod and s keep the original CD system intact while also being able to load ROMs through solid, media, solid state media. So what that means, there's a port underneath the GameCube called the uh, serial port. There are several different ports. They started as the GameCube got older in its, in its revisions, they started taking away things. Um, if you get the ones, if you want to get a GameCube, the one you want to get is as close to launch day as possible. <laughs> One of those early ones. Silver, now. S silver uh, you got to be careful f because that was when they started pulling things out, when they came out with the platinum one. So you have to look. And then it all depends. Just look underneath your GameCube and you can find out. But there's, this is going through, there are two kinds of hard mods. And what this, do, what this does is it intercepts the BIOS, which is your basic input-output system. It intercepts it and injects code into it. And what it does is it loads this system up called Swiss. If, how many of you guys are familiar with Swiss? Good, good, good handful of them. Awesome. Well, Natasha, only because I just did it for your GameCube. <laughs> but uh, Swiss is really cool. It's an open source community project that is being developed for. And and what it allows people to do is to create an emulation environment for games to be loaded. It's basically like, uh, it's kind of a halfway to uh, an ODE, an optical drive em emulator. And it's piggybacking on the Serial 2 port that's fast enough. It has enough bandwidth to be able to load games fast enough. So Anthony, if you go down and go to games, 
This is loading now games from an SD card that is situated underneath the GameCube. So all of these games, how many, if you've watched any of the prices on, on the GameCube market right now, it's ridiculous. I refuse to pay $300 for Gale, XD Gale of Darkness or whatever. <laughs> you, okay, let's find that one. Pokemon XD. Can you? Oh, sorry. So Pokemon starts with a P, Anthony. I want to There you go, Pokemon XD. Okay, hit A. I was looking at the catalog. Okay, so hit A now again. Now mind you, the disc in here is Thousand Year Door, my personal copy. I paid too much for it, but that's the game in there. I, I know, I wish I was smart enough if I had a time machine. Um, but now, this is now loading it off of an SD card. Hit yes. The GameCube doesn't see it any differently. It, it, to, for all intents and purposes, the GameCube thinks that the game is in the game tray. Hit start or any button to continue. And now you can play this game as if you owned it, right? This is a fantastic way. I refuse to pay some of these ridiculous prices that people are asking. I'm all for buying games used. I buy a lot of games used. My wife hates me for it. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Chase, what's up? Yep. Yeah, but what it's doing is, is there's a little board, it's called a quick solder board, that you solder to this chip called the IPL chip, and that's where the BIOS is for the, the GameCube. Now developers have backwards engineered, or backwards, you reverse engineered this entire system so they know what these components do. And then they said, I wonder if I injected code here, could I hijack it? And that's exactly what they did. And now you can hijack the system into thinking, oh yeah, this is, uh, there's the, this is the game in there. And it's using that serial port underneath it to be able to um, send the signal out to the through the GameCube. But that isn't the only mod I've done to this GameCube. How many of you guys own GameCubes right now? Awesome. <laughs> and yours is dead? We should talk. Uh, the, the, yeah, the, the GameCube is notoriously loud. It has a really loud fan. Exactly, because I, there's a new fan mod that's come out for it, where they've found, they've 3D printed, remember I talked about 3D printing being one of the ways of making retro gaming exciting? They 3D printed a bracket that puts a larger fan and it rotates it on its axis. Normally the GameCube fan is like square, it's rectangular and it sits you know, perpendicular to the, to the bottom, uh, or uh, parallel to the bottom, excuse me. This one rotates it so you can fit a larger fan in there and then you're able to get a whisper quiet system. And it keeps the system cooler. You keep your electronic cooler, they last longer. They last longer, you can make them, air, you know, prices heirlooms to hand down to your children. So, um, but this is now running Whisper Quiet. Uh, before it was like a turbo jet had turned on. So Don't mess up, man. Um, while Anthony's playing, this is again, progressive scan display. Uh, you prefer what? F0. F-Zero? Okay. I want you to, Anthony, I want you to do this now. I want you to hit all at the same time, Z, B, A, and start. Okay, this is what we call an in-game reset. Because I have this system installed, let's say I'm like, man, I don't wanna play this game. I can go back without having to leave my seat. Even better if you have a wave bird, right? Um, so, <laughs> right? So, and this was my original wave bird. Okay, um, so he can load up, uh, go back and load up another game. Now there's another cool mod in here that I haven't talked about yet uh, that I am gonna talk about. Anthony, I'm gonna switch you off here. I'm gonna give you the wave bird so you can play. Here you go, keep playing there. So in front of this GameCube, I, I heard, if you heard me say earlier, the GameCube is one of the most modded consoles I've done. I've done about four, I own four of them. I have one that's completely original and then I've modded three others. Um, one of the recent mods that's come out, uh, there's this, uh, I don't know if it's a company or if it's a group, it's called Blue Retro. And what they're doing is they're creating all these analog input devices that you can plug in to your existing consoles and then you can use Bluetooth capable controllers to attach to them. So anything that's PS3 and on, you can use those controllers to play on these original consoles. You could use a PS3 controller to play on an N64. Why you would do that, I don't know, but it's an option. Um, <laughs> 
And you bringing up guests was a terrible idea. So, um, but I know I did. F Zero is one of my favorite games to play on GameCube because the 480p display is super. It's everything's super fast. It's super, and uh, this game is hard. Uh, <laughs> okay, Anthony, keep going, man. Um, there's a panel that was installed here that I just installed last week. It, it incorporates that blue retro technology, but it integrates it inside of the form factor, so it looks clean. It still functions the exact same way as uh, the original console does, but now it's Bluetooth capable. And then it's hard to tell, but there's an LED that pops up in there. Anthony, wait, can you go? Oh, never mind. I'll let you lose this first round. But I can now connect to the front panel with a Bluetooth capable uh, controller. There's these, 8 uh, was one of the companies I mentioned earlier. They offer these dongles that have Bluetooth capability. It can also emulate X input, which you could use for an Xbox. Uh, I told you, I won't have to wait long. Uh, <laughs> so, the, um, the dongle here is able to connect over Bluetooth. It can do X input or switch input as well. So you can actually pair these up with the Nintendo Switch. The Switch has its own sort of proprietary signal, uh, but you can toggle between a Switch here. So I can pair this with my Nintendo Switch and play on a GameCube controller, like I have attached to it right now. But going back to the blue retro here. <laughs> okay, let's hear. Let's hear. We're on lap two of three. Come on, man, you can do this. There's only 29 people in front of you. <laughs> uh. <laughs> yes. Let's go, let's go. <laughs> oh, no. I can't. Uh. Okay, Anthony, I want you to hit start. Okay, ex hit quit. <laughs> okay, click yes, you suck. All right. No, don't leave yet. No, you're, you're going to stay up there. So I want you to go versus battle. So, what? I said... They're very sensitive controls. He's a drummer. Leave him, give him some slack. <laughs> Did you hit B? Okay, go to versus again. I'm kidding, PV. Okay, go to two players. So this is now, this controller is not physically attached to it. It's going over Bluetooth. The great thing about this, the WaveBird, if you don't know, does not have vibration, right? It doesn't have vibration. It's just uh, the, the um, force feedback isn't installed on those. It is on the GameCube controllers if you plug it in. With the Blue Retro, it actually transmits those vibration, uh, the data over. So now I can feel vibrations in this controller, but do it wirelessly. And I'm playing on an analog, the original device. There's almost, Bluetooth is of the formats between 2.4 and Bluetooth. Bluetooth is the laggier one. But I can play just like that. And I can pick a game. Let's go, Anthony. You ready? All right. And then, you want to try this out? Here you go. Let's go. No, you want to, yeah, come on, grab a controller. So then hit start. Let's have you guys go. Click OK or A. Awesome. So, and what was your name, sir? Vince. Vince. So Vince has got the one that's got the actual Bluetooth plug-in. It's going in through this Bluetooth-enabled panel up front, and then he's going to be able to feel the vibrations. So when the track, when he hits the boost on it, or when he hits a bump, he's going to feel it. Whereas in, sorry, what was your name, sir? Jacob. Jacob is not going to feel that. He's only going to, he's going to just be playing like he is on the WaveBird. But both are working, one is using Bluetooth, the other is using uh, 2.4 gigahertz technology, right? Both are are pretty much near zero latency between the two. Of the two, the, the Bluetooth is going to be a little bit laggier, but 8 does done a fantastic job, as has Blue Retro, with making this as fast as possible, so there's almost no perceptible lag. I would not go to a Smash tournament and play on a Bluetooth controller. If you definitely want to go competitive play, you always want to use uh, hardwire. But for casual couch play, this is the way to go. And you can do it from the, you know, from the comfort of your own home. What do you guys do? How does it feel? Yeah? Who's going to win here? Come on, Vince. Come on, man. Oh. Go fast. 
All right, who thinks Vince is gonna win? Give, let's give a cheer for Vince. All right, let's give a cheer for Jacob. <laughs> They're like, I don't know these people. Oh, Jacob won. There, give him a round of applause. Woo, thank you guys. I'll take those. <laughs> hey, hey, hey. Sportsmanlike conduct, please. Thank you. Awesome. And then one more thing I wanted to mention. Thanks. Um, so, uh, one of the other cool features about this is the GameCube was the last console to be able to support the Game Boy Advance cartridge with native play. And the reason why that this console is super cool is, and why I, I've modded so many of these, is because I like playing some of those Game Boy Advance games. Pokemon, Emerald, uh, Fire Red, Leaf Green, those are my jam. I can play them on the big screen through lossless video format with a Bluetooth controller, right? And play them on the actual cartridges. Yes, I could do them with an emulator, but I can actually play my actual saves, right? Uh, and play on my original game. And then take those same games, pull them out of the Game Boy uh, player on the GameCube, and then pop them into my Game Boy Advance and then be able to continue my gameplay that way. Um, but I can do it on the big screen and then do it in this fashion. Um, so the Game Boy Player is really cool. There's another, the, the Game Boy Player itself uh, retails for about 50 bucks, right? You can get them 50, 60 dollars in various conditions. With the disc, because it required a disc to be able to load this software up, it's like an additional 80 dollars. So you end up paying about 150 with shipping and tax, almost 200 dollars sometimes for these things. I don't need that disc anymore because I can do it now through this software. And then I can I have both the original Game Boy Player startup disk, and I also have a community open source developer called the GBI, the Game Boy Interface, uh, that also can load this up, and it will run even better than the original Game Boy Player. But if I, I don't have a Game Boy disk, uh, I'm sorry, uh, I don't have a Game Boy Advance disk in there, but I could, if I could, I can load that up and it'll be just fine. It's like I have the disk. I'm not gonna pay that money, all that money for that when I can just do it this way. I have a cartridge. You have a cartridge? Do you have a Game Boy Advance cartridge? No, oh, okay. The other really cool thing about the Game Boy Player is just like I was telling you earlier, FPGAs can be done to create ROM cards. They are also using FPGA to develop ROM cards for the Game Boys. You can put in what's called a flash card. They have QZ Flash or EZ Flash. They also have the EverDrives. You can plug any Game Boy, Game Boy Color, Game Boy Pocket, Game Boy Advance game into there. And you can also buy those. Oh, you've got a Game Boy cartridge back there. You want to bring it up and have us play it? Is it safe to, to play? It's uh, EverDrive. Oh, it's got, and he's got an EverDrive. Oh. Perfect. You can, you can, nice. So I'm gonna I'm gonna reset it out or go ahead and you can plug it in. Yeah, cool. It's gonna it's gonna repower or repower cycle it I think. So it's gonna load it back up. Is it gonna do it? I think it might load the game in there. Yeah. Okay. So let me do this. So th what I was about to say. What was your name? Aiden. Aiden. So Aiden brought up um, an EverDrive. An EverDrive is those flashcards. It uses again uh, software to be able to, to to play the games. It tricks the game into thinking. Uh, it tricks the console into thinking that it's an actual cartridge. And then you use an SD card with all your games on it, and you can play it. So. Over here, the Game Boy Player will interpret that card in the same way. So it'll load up that EverDrive software, and you should be able to play ROM cards through the Game Boy Player. So let me enable progressive scan. And this is you know, the only official way to play Game Boy content on the screen. OK, moment of truth. Am I going to look the fool? Oh, there it is. So here it is. So. I don't know, what, what should we play, Aiden? Which one? Golden, golden Sun. All right, we're going to play some Golden Sun really quick. So I'm going to start this up. This is playing natively on this console right here, using that, that uh, well, I use the Kanai GC to be able to hijack the game, the console, and it's using an EverDrive to be able to play the game that's going through an SD card on a ROM. So I'm just going to say Isaac and cool. Here you go. So Isaac, wake up. You can use your original Game Boy carts in there, or you can use EverDrives. It all works the same. But
But this is one of the reasons why the GameCube is super fun to mod for, is because as far as features go, it's super feature rich. Even cooler is that the open source community has created emulators that you can load onto here. You can even play SNES and NES ROMs on the GameCube. It's possible. Uh, and it's super fun to do. So uh, that's the GameCube. And I'm looking at my time, and I'm just out of time. Uh, so I'm going to have to wrap up here. Um, does anyone, before I go, does anyone have any questions about any of the stuff I talked about today? Yeah. What? Are all the mods like, that you did, are those in the presentation? Yes, all the mods that I, I talked about are in the, my presentation. I'll put that up on the screen again so people can get that QR code. But everything I did, I installed all these mods myself. I didn't get to the Xbox one or the Dreamcast, um, but the Dreamcast uses an optical drive emulator to load all the games from an SD card. The uh, Xbox I modded to actually have an internal HDMI output. So you can plug an HDMI uh, cable into the Xbox and it'll output 720p, uh, which is a high definition resolution and 60 frames. Grand Theft Auto looks gorgeous on the Xbox. Better than the PS2. I'm sorry, PS2 fans. <laughs> San Andreas, yes, all of them. And it's also loading the Xbox mod. This is the most recent one I did. Also includes an S a solid state drive. So an SSD. The original Xbox came out with a mechanical drive that's got a little disc platter and it spins. And that uh, that's slow and laggy. Solid state, much faster. So the game load times are near instantaneous. You have almost no load screens on the original Xbox. And the Xbox is kind of, this is what we call generation six. Gen six consoles at that point start to resemble computers a lot. So um, they start to become computers. PS3 and on, they're basically mini computers that you're working on. But everything before that, super fun and cool. So I, any other questions? I saw some other heads. Yeah. Yeah, um, I have a Nintendo like, DS Lite. Yes. And so one of the advantages that is that you can play Yes. Yeah. So uh, are you playing on a DSi? A DS Lite? Yeah. The, it's just you're, it, the DS Lite, the DS is basically a Game Boy with a second screen, a Game Boy Advance with a second screen. What you're probably encountering is just unforeseen inconsistencies in the expansion of the chipset. So um, I, can't, I don't know. I'm pretty certain that the Game Boy Advance hardware is still the same inside of the D. It is. It's still the same chipset. Yeah, and so it's effectively the same 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 computing processor. Um, but I'm, I would venture to guess that something else in the signal chain that they've added has is probably introducing some some situation or some issues there. That's my guess. Any other questions? Yeah, Vince. Oh, that's a great question. So, I didn't mention this earlier, but um, so some of these consoles are, you know, 20, 30 years old, right? With some getting up there, uh, you know, 35 years old. Uh, some of the things that are starting to happen to these consoles is their capacitors are starting to go out. Uh, capa electrolytic capacitors are, are a way to store ch uh, store charges inside the console, and it allows the, the it allows the electricity to come out in bursts, so it supports processing and it's an electrical engineering thing, some voodoo magic stuff. All I know is is that those things go bad, and when they go bad, they can actually destroy your console. The most famous one, the most infamous one right now, is the Turbo Graphics. Uh, I think it's the CDI or Turbo Graphics, whichever, the version with the CD system inside, those capacitors were poorly sourced and they go bad, really bad. Sometimes they go bad uh, as early as, um, I think, within 10 years of the console having been released, they were already going bad. And there's a, there's a corrosive fluid that leaks out and destroys the motherboard, so you have to be really careful. So if you have consoles like a Genesis or um, PlayStation 1, or even GameCube is actually still pretty good, but original NES, uh, SNES, Unless you're not, if you're not storing them in good conditions where they're dry and it's free from humidity and it's not super hot and super cold, you should be fine. But those capacitors will go bad even if you don't turn the system on. They just leak out. And so it, if you want to preserve those consoles, if you have original classic consoles, uh, I would say if you have an NES and an SNES and a Sega Genesis, depending on when it was released, you might want to consider having someone recap it for you. 
just and caps last their shelf life is about 30 years so they're getting up to that point if it's under heavy use and 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 very um gets hot all the time then it gets even more to vince's question about power supplies I do, I have upgraded or done some power supply stuff, um, mostly to the Dreamcast, uh, because the Dreamcast uh, has is uh, notorious for running really hot. Uh, these consoles, uh, if they didn't have a giant brick that you attached to the wall, the power supplies were integrated into the system. Well, these power supplies generate a lot of heat, especially when you're going into like the European standard, which is 240 volts, right? There's a lot of power going into those sockets, and it has to step that, that voltage down. And so when you step that voltage down, there's, it's got a, it turns into heat, and that heat radiates. Well, that heat then gets inside your consoles, and then before you know it, your consoles are super hot. That's why they started adding fans. The first console generation to integrate fans into them was generation five. Before that, all consoles before that would just use radiation heat and heat sinks to dissipate that heat. But as the processing compute power got bigger or more demanding, they needed to actively cool the systems down. And then they started taking the power supplies out when they could but then they started integrating them again. And so the, the one that I've done on the Dreamcast is called, um, they have, it's called the Dream PSU. Uh, there's some controversy in the community about it because they say it doesn't actually, it isn't any better than the original. But if you pair it up with actual, like a really good quality power adapter, this one's called BWR Plus, uh, it steps down the voltage really nicely and then it makes the console, you take that power supply out of there, the console runs significantly cooler and it increases the lifespan of your console. So if you have anything with active cooling, the Dreamcast, the GameCube, the Xbox, the PS2, uh, anything with a fan in it, that's getting heat out of there. You want to make sure you're going through cleaning the heat, uh, cleaning those fans up, getting dust out of there, making sure that they're not obstructed. The 360 is infamous for overheating and killing itself, right? Um, and so you want to make sure that you're taking good care of those electronics. But yes, Vince, I do, um, I have started to make amendments to my power supplies. On top of that, I've also started to replace capacity capacitors in OEM power supplies. So the Sega Genesis OEM power supply is a giant brick. There are capacitors inside of there. So I've been opening those up and replacing those capacitors because they're getting at the shelf life about 30 years. And you don't want one of those capacitors to go bad because that could be a fire hazard, <laughs> right? So any other questions? Yeah. Have you ever uh, broken any systems trying to mod it? <laughs> <laughs> Have I broken any? No, I've broken cases. Uh, and early on, there's a process I've been I, I did early on called retro writing. That's where you basically the consoles like the PlayStation and the SNES would start to discolor. They would go from a white color to a beige yellowish color. And so there's a process in, uh, that is well documented called retro writing. And what you use is hydrogen peroxide. It acts as a bleaching agent, and you use UV light to then activate uh, to act as an, um, a heating element, so to speak. And then it's a combination of heat plus the bleaching agents inside of hydrogen peroxide that then leaches, it turns the, uh, the plastic back to its original color. There's controversy about whether that brittles the plastic and whether or not that actually makes it, it's a good process. I did it anyways, but I melted a few consoles, <laughs> uh, console shells that way. Uh, I started with actually an SNES controller that I wanted to retro bright, and I learned my lesson, too much heat is bad. <laughs> so. Uh, I got a little f warped thing, but I keep it on my desk to remind me to, if I'm looking to preserve these things, uh, it's important that I make sure to not, you know, damage them. But I, I look, uh, generally when I mod stuff, I try to find the ugliest things that I can find on, on Craigslist or on uh, Facebook Marketplace or on eBay. People that think it's junk. Be because the shell is replaceable. This is a, now, uh, this is a shell that I got out of China, I'm sorry. Uh, but it's a translucent shell and it's exactly one-to-one -one, uh, a match to the original. And so I replaced, I reshelled it with a new one with a translucent purple. Uh, and then the Game Boy Player is the actual original indigo color that the GameCube was launched with. Um, but that, you know, you can always make consoles look clean and good again. The magic eraser is your friend. Just make sure you're not being too abrasive and really, really fine grit sandpaper to remove particulate matter. And rubbing alcohol is your friend as well. Rubbing alcohol as well goes great on cleaning electronics because it evaporates fast and it's non-abrasive and it won't corrode uh, your your software component or your hardware components. <laughs>
So, but no, I have, thankfully, there was a point where I installed the Dreamcast mod, actually, the HDMI mod on this, because this now outputs pure HDMI through a little jack here. Um, and it requires really fine pitch soldering, uh, where I have to use a microscope to get to it and to see what I'm doing. And I didn't make, I, there was a cold solder joint, and I just didn't notice it. And then I, would, <laughs> I powered it on. This is after two and a half hours of like cutting and stuff and all that stuff. I'm like, yeah, gee, why no picture? <laughs> you know, and then I took it back to, the, you have to unhook everything, take it back to the, my, my uh, workbench, and then try to figure it out. Thankfully, it was just a, a solder joint that I, I'd missed. Um, but when you get to these tiny little pins, the, the more advanced the console, the finer the soldering technique requires. Uh, it requires you to have some experience. So if you wanted to get into so uh, like modding your, your very first console, you know, I would recommend the SNES Junior is a really fun entry level mod that you can do. Uh, and SNES Juniors go for about 50 to $80 on eBay, depending. Uh, and you can get it to output RGB, lossless RGB through a, a scaler. Yeah, Chase. Tip. Yeah. So I, I fixed the Sega Genesis. If you go to like any retro game store, they'll have dollar bins for like things that are away. Yeah. Consoles you can get there and start there. Yeah, exactly. Go, you know, start small. If you want to get into this, start small and and go from there. And if you have, if you don't want to get any sort of opening up your console and stuff. You can benefit by just getting ROM cards. If you have these consoles sitting around, buy an EverDrive. Um, or you can go with the cheap clone EverDrives. I don't recommend them because they have compatibility issues. But get the actual Crix developed uh, EverDrives because they're, they're really, really good. And you can have your entire game library and not have to put pull and push cartridges inside of your system again. Um, and they're all on SD cards. I can't tell you where to get those ROMs, though. The, yeah, the DS ones are pretty good. I didn't bring any of my handhelds, but the DS and the 3DS, um, sorry, yeah, the 3DS and the DS ones are really good. They use, um, it's a cartridge that looks like a 3DS game or a DS game. You stick uh, an SD card in there, and then there's a community, um, an open source software. I forget what it is off the top of my head, but you can install this, um, this shell that then loads the games up. It's really nice. Uh, and all your saves are there, and you can take those saves. This is really cool now. You can take those saves, put them onto an SD card, put them in your computer, put them in an emulator, play on an emulator, take that save file, go through what's called, uh, Analog makes one, it's um, the GB operator. You can plug that cartridge into it. You can overwrite the save file on the cartridge with whatever you've been playing on your emulator and then continue on original hardware if you want it. What's that? Epilogue. Epilogue, sorry, epilogue. Excuse me, epilogue, the GB operator. Analog is another one. Uh, they do the analog pocket. Thank you, Vince. The analog pocket is really cool, and it's an FPGA-developed device. It's emulating the original hardware of the Game Boy, and it is hands down one of the best ways to play Game Boy games on modern hardware and not have it be an emulation. It is, an, it is representative one-to-one -one of the hardware. You can put original Game Boy games into there, or even flashcards, and play the Game Boy as if it were the original, but with a color screen. Yeah. Um, so I have a few questions. First off, yeah. the Lingo. So what do you use for the 3DS? The 3DS, uh, there's, it's called, um, is it Omega? Yeah, t they have different cards that you can buy. The, um, the yeah, they have, you can, if you search them up on eBay uh, or on, on uh, even on Amazon, but the one that I remember is it's the R4 Revolution one that you can get. There is one for 3DS. You can put in a, DC, a DS cartridge inside of a, D, a 3DS yeah. and play it that way. But if you want to do 3DS games, 3DS has had SD cards in them or SD card slots, and you can homebrew and jailbreak a 3DS. It's really easy. Uh, and they made it, and they even had, the last time I checked when the 3DS store closed, there was a, a, a shop that went up. You can browse this shop, and it's like you're browsing the 3DS shop, and you can download the game straight to your 3DS and it's it's that simple. It'll take a long time because you're downloading over that little Wi-Fi wi antenna. It's not very fast. So the best way to do it is to download the games, put it on an SD card. That'll get you playing faster. But you can download straight, direct download to your 3DS through um, jailbreaking that software. I can't tell you more about it. So but is that, is that still going to work after they shut down the, the eShop? Yes, because the, shop, the games are hosted on not Nintendo servers. Yes. <laughs> 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 
Yes, <laughs> there's stuff out there, guys. And the reason you can thank the arcade preservation community for making that possible because it's under the auspice of uh, preservation and emulation. And so uh, there's a, a real interest. The Video Game Fo History Foundation is one of the proponents of this. They are big in helping to make sure that video games are preserved for future generations. And um, I grew up going to arcades. Many of you may not have had that experience, but there's something special and unique, and those machines were designed to play those specific games. And so the, the goal of preservation uh, of those console, of those video game arcade machines is to preserve that history because that is representative, it's art, it's a piece of art, right? And that needs to be preserved because it needs to be able to be seen and viewed by people in the future. And if the technology gets tossed out, which a lot of that arcade tech has, um, when that techni technology gets shucked, then it's lost to time. In fact, there are going to be games, it's, it's estimated there's something like at least 10 to 15% of games that have ever been produced that are like lost to time. You'll never see them again. Uh, and that's unfortunate. Um, but yeah, r preservation of that is really big. That's why emulation is still really big. And that's why uh, working on original hardware has become like a new thing now. Again, leveraging these new technologies. So, any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. What's the best way to play Super Game Boy stuff? Like, Super Game Boy stuff? Do you get the Super Game Boy features when you use that Game Boy player? You. So the Super Game Boy features are, if I'm not mistaken, there was like a crystal in there that played it at a certain frequency speed and stuff. You're talking about the peripheral for the SNES, correct? Yeah, so that played Game Boy games. Like the, the black Game Boy cartridges uh, had sort of two ROMs on them. They yep. A, a version specifically for the Super Game Boy that had additional colors. And yes. Stuff. Yeah. I, there. So you can take, they can, you can emulate that software, I think, through an EverDrive. Yeah. You can do it through an EverDrive if you plug it into original hardware. You can do the same. There's another company called Terra Onion that does another ROM card that's an alternative to Sega Genesis called the Terra Onion Mode. Uh, and then there's a Terra Onion Mega SD. It can emulate the CD system on it. So you don't need, this one I have the CD system attached so I can actually play CD games, but I have to you know, load them up through the CD. That ROM card, all you need is the base model and then it, it emulates the CD system inside of the cart and you can play CD games, CD based game systems uh, through just a single SD card on, on a cartridge on a Sega Genesis. You don't need the peripherals anymore. The Sega CD goes at lowest $150 in whatever condition you'll see it in. That doesn't guarantee it'll work. Working ones are in the ballpark of about two to three hundred dollars. So, wait, so you're saying the setup here with the Everdrive would let you play the Super Game Boy version of the Game Boy game? I can't say that for certain. I've not tried it, but I would imagine it could. I don't think so because it, um, it was actually a physical chip. You're right. Then no, unless the FPGA community, unless somebody. There's, there's, yeah, three ways. Um, you know, like the Nister systems like that. Yes. The actual Super Game Boy software emulation, I believe, are the only three methods. That's why preservation is important because we have esoteric systems like that. Yeah. That software can't always do. Yeah. Exactly. I actually have a Super Game Boy, but I'm having an issue with. Uh, like just image quality uh, on my modern TV, so that's where these mods come in. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It will look great. Yes, it will look great, and and I can't stress that enough. Like um, these consoles can output really great video. It's just that they were constrained by analog design standards, which compress, and especially when you're dealing with component type level stuff, it it um, it compresses the signal. So I just wanted to put this up here again for those of you who might have come in late. Um, the, my full presentation is available online because I, I want, I'm over time already. But you can access this code, um, this QR code. It'll access my presentation. It has all the information that I talked about in there today. Um, and then also, I see some people with their cameras. You guys got it? Cool. And then at the very end, I just wanted to show you guys, um, it's really important. I'm up here. Again, I'm not an electrical engineer. I don't have a background in this stuff. I'm just really, I love tinkering. So I put a resource page at the very end. Uh, I'm, I'm able to do all this stuff because of all the hard work of other really talented developers who know their electrical engineering principles. Um, Red, Rob, uh, Bob over at Retro RGB has been a huge source of inspiration for me. He's really knowledgeable about this stuff. He has a background in industry uh, technology, consumer industry electronics. Um, 
Tito over at Macho Nacho. He does a lot of really cool mods, and his channel is very, uh, very slick. Uh, I really like his stuff. Uh, and he's a really nice guy, and he walks you through the whole process. So if you want to actually mod this stuff and, and tinker on your own, he does a really good job explaining stuff. There's uh, a guy by the name of Alex at Northridge Fix. This is the one of the popular uh, solder repair. Uh, he's a really, um, he's a really talented micro soldering expert. Uh, he does a lot of stuff. He fixes uh, PS4s and PS5s and Xbox, you know, ones and all that. But um, he, I learned a lot of tips from him, watching him about soldering, micro soldering in particular. Crix does the ever drives that we talked about. Um, there's uh, Zach, aka Voltar. He's one of my favorite guys to watch. He's quite the entertainer and very knowledgeable. Very, very, very knowledgeable. Um, has tutorials on how to do a lot of these. Uh, these mods. Um, then there's Mark and Corey over at uh, My Life in Gaming, which is a fantastic YouTube uh, channel. They do documentary style uh, expose, you know, interest pieces on this stuff, and they're a fantastic resource. If you just want to, I put them on sometimes in the background when I'm working because it's such it's such a cool it's a cool thing for me to have my like my childhood and things of my childhood be talked about with such reverence and with a depth of knowledge that is unmatched. Uh, and so Mark and Corey do a fantastic fantastic job. It's, they, they produce this thing called Digital Frontiers. It's a, like a four-part series that's really, really cool. Uh, it talks about video game preservation. It talks about the emergence of FPGA and the Mr. Project. It talks about why this is important to the gaming community and gaming culture. Uh, and then the Video Game History Foundation. Uh, it's a nonprofit organization. Their mission is to preserve video games, preserve this history, because we all are here at Mag West because we care and love about video games. We're also here for music, uh, but we care and love video about video games, and so I'm very passionate about that. I would take it you all are. Um, and so supporting nonprofits like the Video Game Foundation, History Foundation, is really important. So I'm not saying you know, I don't work for them, I don't get a kickback from them, but I certainly, I do give my own money. I give money to Bob, I give money to um, Voltar, I give money to Tito uh, in subscriptions because I believe in supporting these people because they help make the community possible. Uh, and I'm here because of their knowledge and what they've been able to help me do. And I have no electrical engineering background. I just follow the tips. I have a cursory understanding of how these things work, and I make sure I don't burn myself. You know, as simple as that. <laughs> so, without, I, you know, I, if you want to come up and check these up front, up close, I'm, in, I'm I'll encourage you to do that. I'm, I'm like 20 minutes over time. So, um, thank you all for coming out and participating, and have a great Magfest, Mag West.